The national conversation over the role of police in our communities and our schools continues. A recent editorial piece entitled Police Free Schools Challenging the Pandemic to Prison Pipeline argues that police criminalize black and brown students instead of protecting them from external threats. This stems from discriminatory school discipline policies that disproportionately channel students of color from the classroom into the criminal legal system. One of the authors of the article is Mark Warren. He's also the author of the book Willful Defiance, the movement to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. At a recent book launch event, members of the organization Sacramento Area Youth Speaks shared their spoken word poetry inspired by Warren's book. Outcomes being primarily black and brown youth become academically stagnated, leading to suspensions, expulsions, less school participation, stereotypes perpetuated. Is your school pedagogy, discipline, or human elevation? Joining me now are the authors of the editorial piece that I mentioned earlier. Jonathan Stith is the National Director for the Alliance for Educational Justice and the National Campaign for Police-Free Schools. And Dr. Mark Warren is the author of the recently published book, Willful Defiance, the Movement to Dismantle the School to Prison Pipeline. Thank you both for joining me. Jonathan, I'll start with you. How has COVID-19 uh, exacerbated the school to prison pipeline? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. I think um, some... I think one of the ways that we saw is that it was uh, uh, it was able to actually go digital in so many ways. Uh, when we think about uh, one, the, the the story of uh, Grace in um, um, Michigan, who was who was put back in jail for uh, not doing her homework under pandemic. The story of Isaiah uh, in uh, Colorado, uh, twelve year old black boy who was uh, had the police called him because he touched his Nerf gun in virtual class, and so. Part of what we've seen, again, under these pandemic conditions is that the school to prison pipeline has kind of uh, repackaged its, its practices, found ways to be online, uh, and has found ways to continue to grow uh, even as schools have started to reopen. Mark, in your book, you talk about how low-income communities of color uh, organized to dismantle the school to prison pipeline and build a national movement. Talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, yeah, you know, the first people to name and challenge the school to prison pipeline were not professional advocates, civil rights advocates. They weren't scholars like myself. They were people like uh, African-American parents and organizers and young people in places like Holmes County in the Mississippi Delta, the heart of the old slave system, who in the mid to late 90s named the schoolhouse to jailhouse track. Very famous cases of uh, some kids, some black children were throwing popcorn uh, on a bus. Popcorn hit the back of the white school bus driver. He drove the bus straight to the police station and seven African-American boys were arrested and charged with criminal assault. And that launched their campaign to start what they called the prevention of schoolhouse to jailhouse. And from those roots in places like Mississippi, uh, in the book, uh, try to trace how that those movements in Mississippi, then in Los Angeles, then in Chicago, started to spark a national movement and connect these organizations up locally to build a national movement that eventually defeated uh, zero tolerance school discipline policies, which at the time was the law of the land. So I think it's important. We talk about the police, uh, these schools being the latest campaign in the, in the era of challenging the school to prison pipeline people have to also know that grassroots organizing groups of young people and parents, community organizers have been able to make new gains in ending a harsh and racist school discipline policies. And we can do the same with police free schools. So, so let's talk through this idea of police, three, police free schools, Jonathan, because that's a key part of the abolitionist movement um, is mm -hmm. to say, how do we understand a world without policing? The biggest challenge for many people, not all, but many people who oppose abolition is that they can't imagine a world where they can remain safe, protected from harm, uh, without the presence of law enforcement. How can we keep schools safe in the absence of police? Particularly when, when we look at all, the, all the, the data, the biggest concern of parents is not curricular outcomes, it's not test scores, it's not AYP, it's that their kids are safe. So if the parents want the kids safe, kids want to be safe, citizens want schools safe, and people believe that police make schools safe, how do you get police-free schools and still meet that goal? 
I, I think the, the the I mean, one you have to organize for it. You have to to build it. For us in the campaign, we understand police free schools as dismantling uh, school policing infrastructure, culture, and practice, ending school militarization and surveillance, and building a liberatory education system. And so when you begin to ask the question around how do we do it, we believe, uh, as uh, as Asada taught us, that our schools reflect our societies and that we believe that if we can transform schools, we can transform society and that the seed for abolition in a larger society can be planted and grown in schools. And we've seen it. Um, and I think to the question around concerns around fear, right, like those are real legitimate concerns. But what we've seen from the data, the research is that police uh, do not make schools safer. Uh, they only criminalize black and brown students. Uh, even in this current moment where there's a lot of uh, sensationalization around fights happening in schools as uh, students are returning uh, amid a kind of mental health crisis, met with no supports, but the state's response is to add more police to schools uh, and particularly in black and brown schools. Uh, I think this, again, this this sets us up uh, to, again, this rebuilding of the school to prison pipeline. And if we really want to liberate education uh, and really end schools from being prison, then abolition, again, offers a, a way, a strategy, and a practical vision to do so. Uh, Jonathan, I'm going to ask you another question. What are your organizations currently doing to uh, engage in that dismantling of the pandemic to prison pipeline? What are they doing to actually build the police-free schools that we're thinking and dreaming of? Absolutely. I think one of the things that um, we're always excited about or to talk about is the organizing happening really across the country. I think we saw amazing uh, organizing victories in Los Angeles. Students there uh, won a five, uh, I think $30 million or $50 million uh, in reinvestment away from policing towards the supports of black students. Of course, the amazing organizing of the Black Organizing Project in Oakland. Uh, what we've seen in Denver, Colorado as well, uh, organizing for now, kind of what we say is uh, winning police free schools is just the beginning of struggle, not its end, and that there's more work to be done in, in terms of building the system. And I think for us, uh, our vision around police free schools and what safety is, is grounded in a vision of a young person that we lost in 2013, George Carter III. And his vision of school safety was, he would always talk about having schools that had mood detectors instead of metal detectors. Schools that had uh, suspension uh, mm. that has strawberry gardens instead of suspension rooms. And I think when we can understand that that's the vision of safety that black and brown youth have for themselves and for their schools, how could we not want to grow that in our society? And so as Ella Baker taught us, young people are the hope of any movement, and they are certainly the hope of the abolitionist movement. Mark, what more can educators and parents do at a moment where mass criminalization is happening in our schools, particularly for students of color, what can they do to guard against it? What can they do to push back? What can they do to help produce the realities that you all are talking about? Yeah, I think that's important for educators and parents uh, to come together with young people to build a united campaign to remove police from schools and then to move towards restorative and transformative justice alternatives that really attempt to transform the culture of teaching and learning and relationships at the school. Uh, we, you know, we call the book Willful Defiance because um, you know, a lot of students were being suspended and expelled for something called willful defiance, which means they just individually challenged the authority or maybe they acted out. And what we wanted to say was what it really takes to transform schools is for people to willfully defy systems of punishment and control but to do that together with other people, to build a collective movement. These are really deep-seated systems uh, in, our, in our public education system, and it's gonna take a collective effort to really transform them. And that's the work that I think a lot of the organizing groups are doing, and they're trying to find ways uh, to al ally or keep it on the inside, because we can change policies, we can remove police from schools, and we have done that, but that, we think that, as Jonathan said, that's the first step. What we really want is our schools that really uh, empower young people and their families, that teach culturally relevant curriculum, that are built on solid and respectful relationships. You know, a public education system that is really uh, liberating our young people rather than criminalizing them. And I think that takes a broad movement where parents and young people and teachers, and as well as everyone in our society, has a role to play to challenge this kind of system and, and to try to seek an alternative. Absolutely. Jonathan, Mark, thank you so much for joining me on Black News tonight. The work you do is crucial 
uh, and necessary for us to build that world that is freer and safer and more educationally rich for all young people around the world. Everybody, make sure to purchase a copy of Willful Defiance, the movement to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. I read it. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. Uh, and you can pick it up anywhere where independent bookstores are, anywhere where black bookstores are. I know a great one, UncleBobbies.com. You can grab the book and uh, check it out.